Welcome to lecture 28 of our series on prosody. Now, some of the things we've explained in previous lectures contradict popular ideas about prosody. We can call these myths. And while we generally like to focus on the reality as revealed by current research, in this lecture we'll take a historical perspective and see why the popular view is rather different. You know, many people, even some teachers and scholars, think that prosody is mostly about indicating the words and syntactic structure, that the prosody at turn ends is the most important thing, that pitch phenomena, also known as intonation, are the only important thing, and so on. In previous lectures, we've presented a broader view. But in this lecture, we'll go back and consider the, source, the sources of these myths, ultimately in the limitations first by, faced by early scholars. You know, going back a couple of millennia to when people first started talking about prosody, they were not so interested in ordinary speech, let alone dialogue, but in prosody and music. Quick quiz question. What aspects of prosody are important for prosody and music? Well, yes, pitch and duration, and maybe also loudness. So this is one reason why pitch and intonation has always been top of mind when talking about prosody. Another reason is that pitch is easiest to perceive and to describe, not least due to its importance in music and the availability of music notation as a representation, even in the very earliest forms. But in general, music notation is not that useful for speech. Um, and its familiarity may have guided attention away from the other important aspects of prosody beyond pitch. Okay, fast forward to 1569 when Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne. England was prosperous and there was a rising merchant class interested in social climbing, learning how to act and speak well, in particular to speak and act like the best people, the nobility, to speak the Queen's English. And this was a time of growing wealth and leisure and books and publishing, and books appeared to help them. Uh, these, included, these books included rules such as questions go up in pitch at the end. So rules like this met a need. By speaking in this way, you could sound educated, different from those folk who just learned English on the streets. Maybe you remember the musical, My Fair Lady, the themes of elegance and mannered politeness. Now, this rule, questions go up in the end in pitch, is very convenient for, the, for this purpose. It's easy to state. It relates prosody to syntax and punctuation, which, by the way, at the time was something of a new technology. And final pitch is easy to perceive, as we discussed in Lecture 9. So this rule is a very useful rule for its purpose, but sadly not actually true as a general statement of what really happens. So in this sense, it's a myth. In most dialects of English, other than Southern British, the prosody of questions and statements is really pretty complex. And even in received pronunciation, the final rise is not there for many question types. For example, choice questions such as, uh, would you prefer tea or coffee? And many stu studies of real conversation based on large corpora have shown that, you know, despite many attempts to find it, the correlation between questions and rising pitch at the end is very weak at best. So yeah, questions go up is not a valid descriptive rule, but but if you try telling this to anyone who went to middle school in the United States, uh, you'll see that they're not willing to give up what they know to be true. They know it's true because their teacher told them, and their teacher learned it from their teacher, and so back across the centuries. So, uh, challenges. Another factor to mention is the prestige of monologue over dialogue. Presumably the no nobility back in the Queen's Court was mostly giving little speeches, impressive monologues, and more recently, uh, a common model speaker is or, or was the newsreader, especially a few decades ago when speech prosody research was really getting started, becoming quantitative. Uh, newsreader speech, broadcast speech is clean and easy to study and analyze, but it's really quite atypical. There's of course no interactivity, very limited expressions of stance and attitude. The content is complex written sentences requiring the prosody to be devoted almost entirely to marking the sentence structure. It puts a very heavy burden on the intonation and the other prosodic properties are, are little used. So, you know, quite influential, quite atypical. Uh, kind of unfortunately, red speech is still the main focus of most descriptions, most pros prosody research. Well, there's a lot of historical baggage to overcome. And as a result, if you talk to your friends about the interesting new things you've learned in this tutorial, they not be, may not be too receptive. 
we've all been influenced by the, the pitch-centric, monologue-centric view, and by the focus on written language over spontaneous speech. Getting beyond the myths and biases can be a real challenge, but it's not insurmountable. So that wraps it up for our brief historical excursion. The past was dark, but the future is bright. In our final lecture, we will consider how a better understanding of prosody may improve human lives and to discuss some challenges in realizing that vision.